Did you know that you can be part of the lucrative cybersecurity industry? Even top companies like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, IBM, Facebook, and Dell all hire cybersecurity professionals. The cybersecurity industry has a 0% unemployment rate. The average salary for an entry-level cybersecurity job is about $100,000 per year in the United States. Furthermore, you don't need to know coding and learn from your home, and you get a scholarship to kickstart your career. Apply now. EC Council is pledging a $3.5 million CCT scholarship for cybersecurity career starters. Scan the QR code on the screen to apply for the scholarship. Fill out the form. Hello everyone and welcome to today's session, Incident Response Planning, Preparing for Network Security Bridges. I'm Shilpa Goswami and I'll be your host for the day. Before we get started, we would like to go over a few house rules. For our attendees, the session will be in listen-only mode and will last for an hour, out of which the last 10 minutes will be dedicated to Q&A. If you have any questions during the webinar to organizers or our speaker, use the Q&A window. Also, if you face any audio video challenges, please check your internet connections or you may log out and log in again. An important announcement for our audience. As a commitment to closing the secu cyber security workforce gap by creating multi domain cyber technicians, EC Council pledges 3.5 million towards CCT education and certification scholarship to certify approximately 10,000 cyber professionals ready to contribute to the industry. If you want to know more, kindly visit our website given in the chat section. Also, we would like to announce to our audiences about the special handouts. Take the screenshot of the running webinar and post in your social media, LinkedIn or Twitter tagging EC Council and Cyber Talks. We will be sharing three handouts to first 15 audiences. Our speaker for today's session Mays P. Guzman. Mays leads one of the big four global delivery services team in the Philippines, servicing the biggest clients globally. She is the first certified chief information security officer in the Philippines and has received numerous industry accolades, including Asian top women in cybersecurity for top 2021 and 2022. The Philippines top women in security for 2020 Global Epic Women in Cyber and Global Women Who Inspire Honorary to Name Advisory Board, which comprises prominent and global industry leaders and top threat intelligence professionals from diverse sectors and global known brands. She has lived and worked across the APAC region as a head of cybersecurity and threat intelligence. Maze is a seasoned, proven leader with extensive experience in setting up cybersecurity centers of excellence business transformations and large scale threat into business and technology operations and helping global leaders address critical security and risk concerns. Without any further delay, hand over the session to you, Mays. Yeah, thank you so much, Shilpa. I, I hope you guys can hear me well. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, so, yeah. so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, right? On whatever time zone you may be today. I know it's been I know it's been like two years since we had our cyber talk on SOAR or the security or orchestration automation and response. And I just really want to thank Easy Council for inviting us again. And now on this very important topic on incident response planning, specifically on preparing for network security breaches. I know it's a very broad topic, right? And I'll try as much as I can, as Shopa mentioned, to cover this general topics in the next 45 minutes or so, but really jumping straight to the agenda today, right? So we will be covering the current uh, cybersecurity threat landscape, the role of incident response in incident response planning, incident response for common attacks, incident response phases, and then the incident response planning um, altogether. And with this, as I always do, right, let me open the session with this quote that says, cyber attacks are actually not a matter of if. It's not a matter of if now, but it 
it's already win, right? Now, a very quick search. When you do a very quick search related to 2023 uh, cyber attacks or cyber statistics would actually show that the global annual cost of cybercrime is predicted to exceed 8 trillion USD by this year, by 2023, right? In the same year, again, 2023, 38% of the CISOs actually expect more and more serious attacks. And as we always see, right, the cyber attacks now happen once every 39 seconds. It's not even minutes anymore. Or it's even every 39 seconds, there is a cyber attack that's happening. So if you compare the data last year, actually 2022, right, the average total cost of data breaches was 4.35 million US dollars. And then uh, from that study alone, 43% 40, of all the cyber attacks are aimed at small businesses or the SMBs, right? And again, another 43% of those SMBs do not actually have a cybersecurity plan or an incident response plan in place that makes them very susceptible to the attacks per se. So I did cover the first line already, but other very interesting facts, right? right? So, so we were saying that last year, 2022, again, 76% of organizations were targeted by a ransomware attack. And out of which 64% were actually infected. So the success rate on being infected when you got targeted is actually very high. That's as high as 64%. And if you can see also only 50% of most organizations manage to retrieve their data after paying the ransom, right? And then additionally, and there's another addition, a letter over 66% are respondents to that survey reported that they have had uh, multiple isolated infections. So it's even recurring. Now, this third line is very important to everyone. And this is what we always say to the people that we talk to day in, day out, every day, right? By 2025, 45% of global organizations will be impacted in some way or another by a supply chain attack. And we see this happening today. It's very prevalent already. So with the ever expanding threat landscape, right, that we have seen over the past years with the new technology and enablers, you can also see on your screen, it's not just about IT anymore. There's OT, there's IoT, there's cloud, there's mobile, there's 5G robotics, artificial intelligence, ML quantum codes, social media. There's just so many technology enablers and targets, if I may, right? And also there's a lot of digital transformation or transforming with new digital channels. And we've talked about that um, automation, artificial intelligence. We do have blockchain now, we do have the cloud and other advanced technologies which are now more exposed to new cyber risks. And then the second line that you're seeing are those that are related to your geopolitical and social drivers altogether that also has an impact on our cyber landscape altogether, right? So social activism, as you see that tribalism, loss of trust, trade war, techno-nationalism, recession, economic inequality and resource gaps, what have you, there's just so many of them. And of course, what we're familiar with is security professionals on the third hand side, right? The ever so famous ransomware or disruptive malware. We have your trusted insiders that are related to corporate espionage or data theft. We have the weak supply chain that we have already mentioned earlier, the subverted code chip IoT device integrity we have the AI data set or algorithms, subversion, accidental actors, which are the ones who are really falling prey to spam, phishing by mistake, and those that are having increased regulatory oversight. So that is our 
cybersecurity landscape at the moment. Um, not losing so much time, right? I'll just quickly jump in. So there are still a lot of confusions going around on what is an event versus an alert versus an incident and just being interchanged again and again. So I, I just really want to lay out the foundation on what is an event versus an incident or versus a crisis. And I think these things are very clear that an event is really an unusual occurrence with potential to adversely affect the organization. It's not yet an incident per se, right? But an incident is an event that has already occurred, which has adversely affected the organization. And then, of course, there comes the crisis, which is an incident or a series of incidents with potential to seriously harm the organization, its processes, objectives, stakeholders, of course, reputation, that thing we really don't want to happen to everyone, reputation loss, and then existence, right? So these things should be very clear before we actually move forward. But then the meat of this all, right, incident response. So when we talk about incident response, it's really a very structured approach to handle various types of security incidents. So it could be cyber threats and data breaches, but really, as it mentioned here, the goal of the response are to eliminate a cyber attack as quickly as possible, recover, notify any customers or government agencies as required by regional laws, and really learn how to reduce the risk of a similar breach in the future. Okay, um, and we do have an incident response for common attack types on this slide, which is actually very interesting because we do have the seven of the most common attack types. And then what it is, the threat indicators, where to investigate and so on, right? So say for example, brute forcing, we have botnet, we have ransomware, we have data exfiltration, we have the compromise account, we have the denial of service, DOS or DDoS, as we keep on um, calling them, or, and APTs, or the advanced persistent threats, right? Now, I want to deep dive at least on two of them, and we, <laughs> we don't have too much time, but let me cover brute forcing as the first items, right? If we talk about the entire brute forcing concept, and it did mention there what it is already, right? So the attacker is trying to guess a password by attempting several different passwords. And then you see the threat indicators, which says multiple login failures in a short period of time. And a couple of big red flags that you will see, right, with brute force attack, it, it could be it could be a single IP attempting to log into multiple accounts or multiple IPs attempting to log into a single user, a single user account, right? But one best practice is to really set a limit, right? For how many failed login attempts can occur within a certain period of time. So it could be setting and enforcing rate limits um, as we keep on calling it right it's a really a great way to limit the traffic on your web application and your network server and in this particular context right you can configure our resources to only allow a specified number of failed user login attempts within a set period of time so meaning if i will set it on a five failed user login within one minute or so, or with an account user policy that is very specific, we can actually set accounts to lack of users after so many failed attempts, right? So those are at least some best practices on how we can actually prevent brute forcing to happen. But as everyone knows, right, I'm actually a very big opponent of SOAR. So let me give you an example of an automated incident response um, playbook 
or an automated playbook on responding to an RDP brute force attack, which is one of a very good use case that I've seen that's happening really on the ground. So let's talk about RDP for, for a minute or two, right? So remote desktop protocol, it's, it's, a, it's a huge concept. Everyone is using it, right? It's a widely used technology that allows users, right, to remotely access and control computers and servers over a network connection. So it could, or it is commonly used for the purposes of could be remote administration, technical support, and telecommunicating, right? So if I say, hey, I want an RDP in your computer, someone is doing remote administration on my computer. But as everyone knows, right, the convenience of RDP also comes with the potential risks. And according to a very good report, 73% of organizations have RDP exposed to the public internet. That makes it a very, very, very good target. So not very, it's a really very good target. So let's talk about RDP brute forcing as a use case in this playbook, right? So RDP brute force, again, as the name suggests, refers to a type of cyber attack. We did mention about brute forcing earlier in which an attacker systematically attempts to gain an authorized access to a network by again repeatedly guessing or brute forcing the password of that RDP account. So the, the very interesting news or report is that 25% of issues found on the attack surface when you do an external attack surface assessment or things of that sort, right? was related to an exposed RDP server. So imagine one out of four of the issues found on your attack surface was already related to an exposed RDP server. So that's very huge. Now, if you look at this automated playbook, right? You can see the first one, an alert is triggered. Maybe our team has fired an alert. Now the SAR playbook has actually been triggered. And since we are always recommending a modular approach to SOAR or playbooks, right? This is, this is at least a very modular approach. So you can see on the blue box, there's an enrichment uh, box. So this is our enrichment sub-label. So we enrich the information on IP addresses for both Again, for both the compromised users and attackers, right? So this particular playbook will automatically gather the following information. I will have the IP data and reputation from all the available and configured IP enrichment sources that is connected to my SOAR platform by API, right? And then the user information from internal user management ecosystems, it could be your Active Directory or other directory systems or any sort. So I will enrich, again, all the information on IP addresses for both the users and attacker. And then if the attacker's IP is actually detected, you can see that um, on the initial containment part, right? So if the attacker's IP is detected as a known malicious IP, then SOAR will execute an initial automated or maybe semi-automated response action that includes blocking the attacker's IP and also disabling the compromised user. So that's a green boxing initial containment. And that's another modular playbook that will be called on, right? An IP blocking sub playbook and disable compromised user sub playbook, if I may. And then the next steps is or the next steps would actually include performing an automated deep dive investigation. Those on the yellow lines, right? So we are exploring certain investigation um, criteria all together. You can see the middle box right there, we're getting threat intelligence insights, maybe from a tip or a, or a threat intelligence platform, which is again, a soft playbook that will 
raise a flag if the attacker's IP address is found to be related to a specific campaign reported by a threat info feed, for example. So the sub playbook will also provide IOCs that are related to the attacker's IP or the entire campaign. And that is very useful. And then the box that you're seeing, the other box you're seeing is that it's searching for it's searching for uh, connection anomalies, right? If you're searching for connection anom anomalies, it's actually another sub playbook, which is a user investigation playbook, for example. What it does is it will raise a flag in case that the RDP connection attempt is made from an unusual country for the user. Again, automatic flag because it's a country that you will not really have an RDP connection to or from, right? Now, the other box is saying that I'm searching an alert that is actually related to the compromise user. It could be in my SIEM or in my XDR and the compromise endpoint within the same timeline. I'm looking for a same timeline as the RDP brute force alert which could actually indicate follow-up malicious activity if we're using the MITRE attack tactics, right? So if we follow MITRE alone, we have persistence, we have discovery, we do have lateral movement, we do have collection, we do have command and control, and then we do have impact. So aside from that, we're also hunting for IOCs that are very related to the same campaign as the attacker's IP using threat hunting sub playbook. And again, uh, a particular flag will be raised in case that results were actually found. So we, we've done with the enrichment and investigation. It's actually time to make a verdict, right? It's setting an incident verdict. So it's a time that me as an analyst, I will make a decision. Is this incident, is, is this an is this alert warrant an incident, right? And there are actually three different or key factors that are used in this automated playbook to determine whether the incident is malicious. The good thing with an automated playbook is that you can actually put in the threshold already. You don't need to manually think about, oh, is this malicious or not? And then I need to dig in so many other things for me to make the decision. There are three ways we're in we can actually make that. So the first one is the count of investigation, right? There are companies that are using the count of investigation criteria to be able to verify or to be able to say that it's malicious. So as compared to the threshold, for example, set by the user. So if I say three out of five is malicious, does it warrant malicious, your, yes or no? So the SOAR playbook or function or that decision box will actually tell me, yes, it is. So it's, it, it's time for me to say, yes, it's an incident. There's also a second criteria or there's also another way on doing this wherein the analyst can select a specific investigation criteria that if identified, it doesn't necessarily mean that I need to have the threshold. But if that criteria is met, it will automatically deem that the final verdict is actually malicious, right? Regardless, again, regardless of the count. And then lastly, it depends on the user engagement. So meaning when an analyst sets a number of suspicious investigation uh, criteria that will trigger a user engagement. So I'm the analyst that I'm, I'm the analyst who is investigating. So I will trigger an automatic email to the user and their manager asking for, hey, is this RDP actually authorized? Is this an authorized activity? Yes or no. So if the RDP activity is not authorized by the user, the final verdict is deemed, is deemed malicious. But of course, the third one is actually very slow because you need to have the third party or a user um, acknowledgement for it to be done. So those are the three things that we can consider in terms of verdicts, right? Now, if I already said that it's a malicious um, 
um, activity. So it's really uh, an engineer, right? The final verdict is that it's malicious. So I will be initiating again automated or semi-automated uh, response procedures that you can also see on your screen, right? I can block the attacker's IP using a block IP sub table. I can disable the compromise account using a block account sub playbook, and I can expire compromised user passwords. Also, I can isolate endpoints using an XDR if I am using an XDR and if I'm actually authorized to do that. But there are specific sub playbooks that I can automatically trigger for response actions, right? So if deemed not malicious, if it doesn't fall into the malicious category per se, right? Then we close the incident with the right of saying this is not malicious and this are the this are the things saying or accounting that it's really not malicious and so on, right? So in conclusion, I just really want to highlight that a well-defined playbook, right, for investigating and responding to this RFP or this RDP brute force alert is very crucial for safeguarding our systems. So we also need to regularly update our playbook to stay ahead of evolving threats and the landscape. So the good thing now with all the tools or the automation and orchestration tools that we have is that we don't need to be on the blind. We, we, we cannot or we will not be blindsided on what will happen next, right? I may not know that the next step would be to block the compromised user or the attacker IP, et cetera. But this at least is a very organized workflow for everyone to use in service guides uh, for everyone. So moving ahead, the second use case or the second example that I have is actually ransomware. And now I'll take this an example, as an example because this is the thing that's really rampant everywhere, right? When a ransomware attack is detected, again, if we if we try to envision the diagram that I presented earlier, right? When a ransomware attack is detected by an alert source, we can trigger a post-intrusion ransomware investigation and response playbook, which again is semi-automated, right? To identify, investigate, and contain the ransomware attack. So this semi-automated playbook helps us or will better help us understand the status of the attack by, by collecting the information needed from the environment, right? So those steps, again, a playbook on how do we contain the incident, how do we display the data with a post-intrusion ransomware incident layout, and so on. Now the required input on this particular playbook is actually the actual ransom note and an example of an encrypted file to identify the ransomware variant and find the most appropriate recovery tool via the online database. So also part or very important part of this playbook is to notify all their relevant stakeholders automatically, which is again, very crucial for a ransomware attack or a ransomware incident, right? So the playbook again, includes a manual task for determining the incident pipeline. So there is a ransomware, an important part of that incident is actually to determine the incident timeline um, because it's very essential to the recovery process. Since the, since the data encryption is the final step in the attack, the prior actions of the attackers are investigated as well. So it's very crucial the incident timeline is very, very crucial, right? So if you look at the steps here, right? Um, the playbook performs automated user and host data enrichment. And then it performs automated endpoint isolation and user revocation. It also provides guidance to retrieve the necessary files to identify the ransomware strain, which is very important. And it's extracting indicators from the ransomware node itself. So including 
cryptocurrency and onion addresses and so on, which is also very important for this investigation, right? So if you if you look at onion addresses, right, these are URLs that point to the servers on the Tor network, which can only be accessed through the Tor browser. So in, in a very simple term, they're actually not listed in the public DNS or they're not listed on the public DNS record and are just based on cryptographic hashes of public keys, right? So this playbook or this ransomware playbook also provides guidance on additional um, recommended investigation steps such as endpoint forensics, um, searching for more infected endpoints, and also investigating activities of the infected users. And then again, perform active directory forensics and automatically block malicious indicators. So very crisp and very detailed ransomware playbook on a semi-automated fashion is actually what we're pushing as well on everyone that we're talking to. So again, on the key item on what is an incident response plan, right? Or the main key of, of this session. So the incident response plan is a set of instructions again to detect, to respond to, and limit the effects of an information security event, sometimes called an incident management plan, an emergency response plan, which provides clear guidance for responding to several potential scenarios, including data breaches, right? So the thing that we have discussed earlier on how we're actually laying out once um, there's a, an RDP brute force or ransomware attack, et cetera, is actually part of this, right? Now, there are certain things that we really need to consider for incident response, and that's the incident response life cycle. So preparation, identification, containment, um, eradication, recovery, and then lessons learned, right? So the incident response life cycle, so we're calling everything as a life cycle consists of a sequence of serial phases, right? Again, preparation identification, you can see it on the on the on the circle right there. And it's actually a sequence. So preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovery and improvement. And then there are parallel activities that you can see which are also very important, communication, analysis, and then documentation. So this life cycle is actually derived from many standardized incident response processes, such as those processes or those that are published by NIST and other authorities, right? So if we try to quickly break down what are the things here, right? The, the first phase is really um, preparation. So preparation phase is characterized by certain activities or there's certain things, right? There are three things that you can actually see here to begin with, with your preparation for your incident response. So one is really establishing and organizing and maintaining an incident response process and capability. It's very important, it's very core. We also need to acquire and maintain the required tools and resources for incident response activities. Manual will be very hard um, to be honest, but we also need to have the appropriate training to staff with their responsibilities. So all the staff really needs to be trained and it needs to be clarified and it needs to be clear on their, on, on their roles and responsibilities altogether. Now, the second phase is identification, right? So when a potential incident is escalated for analysis, now the diagnosis or what we call this identification or the investigation of the alert begins. And in this phase, we actually determine whether or not the incident has occurred, right? So if the incident has occurred, then 
us as analysts or an automated tool as what we have discussed also earlier will categorize the incidents and assign severity level to be automatic, to be manual, depends on your organization. It's also in this space wherein we determine the complexity of the incident, right? We quantify the people affected, the complexity of the tools used to gain access, etc. We notify the business data owner if there is a sensitive information or critical assets that are compromised. And then we also engage cross-functional support if required. So this phase as well is very important, the identification phase. And then quickly onto the next phase, which is really the containment and eradication, right? So the containment phase should actually limit, it needs to limit the damage that an incident may cause. So that's the very intent of containment. While at the same time, you're also causing the least possible impact to business critical processes, right? So it really requires decision making. So for example, determining whether I need to shut down a system versus it's a very critical system and production. It's very critical for the business. Can I disconnect it from the network? Can I just monitor its activity or disable the functions such as um, the remote file transfer, the RFE? But yes, I did mention earlier, a good thing now is that there are actually thresholds that can already be set to automate this function, right? Though it still needs careful analyst decision and then really just need to think through it very carefully because it's, it's very critical. So there's also one that's a short-term planned action that may remove access to compromised systems, for example. So I will, I will limit the extent of the current damage to a system and prevent additional damage from occurring. So that's the entire containment phase, right? But again, depending on, depending on the type, depending on the criticality, depending on the, on the category of the incident, depending on the incident progress, right? So specific steps are really to be followed to limit the scope and the magnitude of the incident as quickly as possible. So we, we all, always also say that containment is, a, containment is a higher priority activity than collecting the evidence for identifying or litigating um, the trigger. This is make or break. This phase is literally make or break for everyone. Now, we also have the eradication phase where, wherein we apply certain measures to really just eliminate, as, as the word suggests, right? Eradicate, meaning to eliminate the causes and effects of an intrusion or attack to a point where the risk of re-emergence, right? Or recurrence of the cause is reduced to zero or really just to mitigate to a minimal or acceptable level. So it really cannot be 100% reduced to zero. Both are definitely acceptable in this process, right? So again, when we say eradicate, it doesn't necessarily mean reduce to zero, but really to an acceptable level that was set by the organization as well. So there are different examples of eradication actions, right? So it could be, it could be one, um, performing a vulnerability analysis. So vulnerability analysis tool shall be used to scan exposed systems, services, um, and applications that are connected to affected systems. So it, it, it could be one of the first step of eradication um, actions. And then two, we could actually improve the security controls, right, on the affected system and other systems. So the appropriate um, protection techniques shall be implemented in the environment where appropriate. So it could be 
applying security patches, for example, it could be um, changing the system name or even the IP address, right? And securing and protecting boundary defense hardware and software. So we could introduce a NAT if the organization doesn't have a network um, access control yet. Um, we can implement a two-factor authentication, which is very common, but unfortunately, other companies don't have it yet, right? Or in extreme or very extreme cases, we need to port the machine's functions to a, a more secure operating system. Um, another example would be really focusing on removing malignant artifacts, right? We concentrate on the eradication of malignant artifacts and also on the eradication of the benign artifacts if they persist, if they if they actually present serious risk, but if only they present serious risk, right? And then the last one as an example would be to, to thoroughly remove the artifacts from all media to so that we can ensure that all the malicious artifacts are removed from all systems and media by using one or more of the proven commercial um, tools or commercial eradication application, or by even manually surgically removing um, following an in-depth malware analysis, which actually needs to happen as well to identify the entirety of the malware package, or by even rebased lining the systems. So again, eradication could come into so many other forms aside from the examples provided, right? And then next we have the recovery and improvement. So if you can see this phase, in this phase, the affected systems are restored to normal operational status. And again, recovery begins when the cause of the incident has already been eradicated or mitigated to agree to a degree that it's acceptable so we coordinate now with the business units or the IT operations for implementation of recovery actions we definitely need to have that coordination again luckily we do have those sort of functions now to automatically do that uh, an important step on this process is that we have access to backup data and systems so we definitely we need an entire inventory of all the approved hardware and software and monitored access to systems so again very critical we also need to have the appropriate authority right to have timely access to management approvals so if we need a very immediate management approval and so on that's very important on this phase and of course um, we also need to be responsible for ensuring that only the authorized personnel have access to live systems and data um, on this phase right now to document the entire thing so we're now in the documentation of the recovery phase right so we need to decide the system restoration procedure. So there are a lot of questions being asked, oh, hey, Mais, what's the best system restoration procedure? But there are so many, several restoration options available depending on the severity of the incident, right? There's actually no one, one, one fits all kind of answer to this. So it depends on the severity of the incident, depends on the sensitivity of the system affected, it depends on the backup systems available and it depends on it depends on so many other factors right so the selection really of the best option may require the involvement of other management or authorities right it could be the application or the data owner or the CISO and other senior management etc another step would be to validate the data restored from and trustworthy sources, right? So when when I say validate data restored from an an trustworthy sources, I mean in restoring the files, right? Other than the operating system and application files, only the most trusted backup, only the most trusted backup should be used. 
So we definitely need to be careful with that because the the restored system data and user files shall be investigated for altered data. And sometimes, unfortunately, there will be altered data or other signs of compromise that we have seen. So definitely, we just need to have this step validated altogether. And then the validation of the restored system before returning to service is also very important. So we need to have that validated prior to restoration of network. For example, before we restore it to network connectivity, we need to verify that all known vulnerabilities have been mitigated, right? So we've talked about have these systems been 100%, not 100%, but at least patched, right? Or, or even um, done your entire technical specifications, hardening, rehardening again. And then we have our authorization and communication with users before restoring the service. So again, very important step um, before reconnecting to the recovered system to the network, we need to, again, tell or notify any organizations that would be affected. Um, and then we need to also conduct a review of the security controls. We need to verify that the system is configured in accordance with the configuration uh, management guidelines. And so, for example, logging, auditing, um, functional programs, for example, and any other security tools are functioning again. So there might be tools that were already taken out or disabled. We need to ensure that all of that are actually back on the, on the system. And then last example for this particular phase, right? We need to monitor the restored systems. So what it means is we need to maintain a high level of confidence in the security of the restored systems. So we did talk about vulnerabilities, we did talk about other analysis and so on, but this step is really very important. So uh, I'll just skip through the incident response phase on lessons learned. So this is really just where we conduct a structured debrief, right, with all the involved parties. The SEV1 incident debrief or SEV2 incident debrief is definitely um, different to that of a SEV3 or SEV4, right? So if you're doing a process review, there are so many things that we can ask. So if we were doing the debrief or the process review, there were around a lot of questions related to the documented procedures, right? Were the documented procedures adequate is the automated playbook appropriate? So was there effective internal and external communications that was sent out? So what information maybe if any was needed sooner and what's the greatest hindrance to moving through with the process? So those things you can actually ask um, on corrective actions again and how can you better simplify the process moving forward or if you want other tools tweaks on your use case, on your playbooks, etc. So this is where the process or in those debriefs actually happen. And then quickly, this is very quickly how to create an incident response plan. Very important is the policy, right? We need to develop or update an incident remediation and response policy, very foundational document. I did mention about creating an incident response team with very clear roles and responsibilities. And then we did at least talk about the development of the playbooks earlier. It could be automated, fully automated, semi-automated, or manual, depends on the organization. The creation of the communication plan is also very important to everyone. It could be, we, we talked about the cycle, right? So the communication on different stakeholders, whether external or internal, is again very important. Testing the plan definitely needs to test this incident response plan. The identification and documentation of the lessons learned, which is the last part that we have also discussed. And then regularly test and update the incident response plan, right? So that is the very critical plan to make sure that everything is actually um in place 
So my last slide is actually regarding the proactive versus reactive um, incident response. All right, so you can see here, um, say assess and improve. So there are actually a lot of ways. We can do an incident response maturity assessment to assess a cyber incident um, simulation, a cyber compromise diagnostic, a resilience assessment, again, an IR plan development and improvement, a purple red teaming, et cetera, and so on. And then if we talk about all the react part, right, it could be your containment, eradication, and recovery, and then the forensics, and then comes preparation. So with this, this is actually my last slide already, and I hope I was able to cover some um, concepts as it relates to incident response planning. So thank you. Back to you, Shilpa. Thank you so much, Maria. It was, uh, so much, Maria. It was uh, an informative session, and our attendees said the same sentiments. Before we begin with the Q&A part, I would like to inform all the attendees, if you're interested to learn more about our programs, do let us know in the poll that's going to be conducted now. Let us know your preferred mode of training and we will reach out to you soon. Uh, Maria, shall we start with the Q&A? Our first question is by Debushish. As the saying goes, you can't secure what you can't see. So how does the proactive security model works? Yeah, so if you look at the proactive model, right, in this, let me just quickly get into that. So all of the things that you're assessing, it could be your external attack surface, it could be your internal thing. So the clear visibility on your entire attack surface is very important per se. And from there, you have your entire external, internal attack surface. We actually do a continuous threat um, hunting. And then the process actually continues on and on. But definitely the most important part is that you have a clear inventory of what you have in terms of the assets. And then you also know your attack surface. It could be your external, which other organizations actually don't focus much. They focus on more on the internal or what's in their um, internal attack surface, but not really on the external part. So mostly on the assess part, we're doing a lot of the external attack surface management and all of the things that are related to visibility. Yeah, I hope that answers. Thank you, Mays, for answering that question. Our next question is by Hussein. Uh, can you explain botnets, data exfiltration in detail? Yeah, so I, I think there was a, we do have this, let me just get to that. So the reason why I did not cover botnets specifically, right, because this is a bit of a, it, it's very difficult to actually have a playbook, which is automa automated for, for this one. So botnets, if you can see what it is, right? Attackers are using the victim server to perform DDoS attacks or other malicious activities. So it looks like, uh, it actually looks like a valid connection. But when in fact the attackers are already using the victim server, your server, to perform DDoS. So you can continually get a DDoS attack or malicious activities altogether. So your threat indicator, and you can see here, right? It will automatically alert. So say, for example, you have put into your scene that there would be connection to suspicious IPs, and then it will trigger because of abnormal high volume of network, network traffic, because you can actually see, oh, this is already a DDoS, right? Those are botnets. The other question, is it data exfiltration, uh, Shilpa, is that question? Yes, yes, exfiltration in detail. Data yeah, exfiltration. so data exfiltration, yeah, as it says here, right? The attacker, but the attacker could also be someone from internal. It doesn't necessarily mean you are really from an external point of view, right? You could be an internal 
employee. So you exfiltrate, as the name suggests, data exfiltration. You exfiltrate data to the external sources, right? So you can see here that the threat indicator would be an abnormal high network traffic, which is connecting to a cloud storage solution. Could be your, your, your Dropbox, could be your Google Cloud, and then it could be going outside to your initial USB stick. So you're just exfiltrating data. It could be, again, from an attacker or from an internal employee or uh, a rogue employee. Thank you, Mace, for answering that question. Our next question is by Mohammed. Is Casper Sky effective against ransomware? Is what, is it, sorry? Casper Sky. Uh, K A S P E R S T Y. Yeah, Kaspersky. Yeah, yeah I, I get it. So I, I cannot really comment on any product security. So I, I will say that any product that is actually out there in the market has proven that they have done something significant for the cybersecurity industry. But just I cannot I cannot comment to any product security or any product vendor uh, at the moment. <laughs> Uh, no worries. Thank you, Mays. Uh, next question is by Amit. How can we meet automation of prioritization? Yeah, so prioritization within the store platform, for example, right, there are different priorities depending on the severity of the incident. So if you're manually doing it, there is a severity matrix, right? Severity one, two, three, four, and then you actually do the priority. So similar thing in a SOAR playbook or an automated playbook, you can also set priorities, severities, and other things automatically. So it, it can be all in that system altogether. So you can just have it on a, on a, on a box and so on, and it will automatically flow. Thank you, Mace. Uh, we'll take last two questions for the day. Our next question is by James. When do we decide forensic is necessary and at which stage do we collect evidence? Example, uh, is it done before containment? No, it's actually done after you have done the decision. If you remember the playbook or the our, our, our playbook, right? It will tell you that it's malicious or not. So if you're telling me that it's a malicious, yes, it will go to a certain action. But that certain action would also fall into different categories altogether. So you will actually try to figure out or the SOAR platform, or it could be you, will trigger an automated alert which would happen happen next, but it, it needs to be after you have done the containment. It needs to be after the decision that it's actually a malicious um, trigger. And it actually needs to have a severe, severe um, severity as well um, to be able to trigger the forensic steps. So uh, yeah, I hope that answers. Thank you, Mace, for answering that question. Our next question is, how can you recommend specific IR metrics that can be used to measure and mature our IR program? So IR, IR matrix, for example, actually is also dependent on the severity matrix, right? There are also different matrices depending on severity like severity one two three and four and how to better improve um depending also on the attack types so everything actually needs to map out or mapped out on different matrices but i think it's a it, it's going to be a very long conversation whoever actually have that um question just feel free to message me on linkedin or other um, areas I'll be very happy to answer on a long manner because I, I think I also have a very big write-up related to this. So we, we can have it offline. 
Thank you, Mace. Uh, we have just got one more question. So last question for the day. Uh, how do we ensure specific date of data restoration is safe in scenario of ransomware? Yeah, so I think I've also discussed about how we will restore it safely. And I did mention earlier that there are different types of data restoration, again, depending on the severity, depending on the incident types, et cetera. So to be able to know that the restoration is actually safe, we're doing a lot of things that I also mentioned earlier. So one of that is ensuring that the controls are actually in place already. We have all the vulnerabilities, um, patch, etc. So there's an entire checklist as well. So even 100 plus checklists, you don't need to complete everything for that data restoration. I think you can actually, there's a template online. If you search data restoration checklist, you can also find it online. It's, it's very prevalent as well, but there is actually a checklist if you want the complete thing aside from the things I've mentioned earlier. Thank you, Mace. Uh, thank you again to our wonderful speaker for answering those questions and for the great presentation and knowledge shared with our global audiences. It was a pleasure to have you with us and we are looking for more and more sessions with you. Before we conclude the webinar, would you like to give a small message to our audiences, please? Well, thank you so much again for joining. I know it's late for most of you. It could be wherever you are in, in the world, but thank you really for spending an hour with us here today and, and I really hope to have more sessions in the future so thank you again thank you Maria for the message to our audiences uh, now before we end the session I would like to announce our next cyber talk session top skills required to start a career in cyber security which is scheduled for July 12 2023 this session is an expert presentation by Mike admin entrepreneur and technology leader to register for this session please do go visit our website www.ecouncil.org slash cybersecurity exchange slash cyber talks. The link is given in the chat section. Hope to see you all on July 12th. You may now disconnect your lines. Thank you.